right now. I am just so mad because I read this athletic article on Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith. ESPN's first take, Skip and Stephen A. Embrace debate, played the hits, and changed TV. Yeah, that's all well and good. But this article was concretizing and enacting racist tropes. It's just, I am so mad right now. All right. So this article says that uh, Skip Bayless wakes at dawn to run for an hour and memorizes a daily packet of notes to prepare for debates. Right. Typical white stereotypical you know attitudes that uh, you should prepare for debates and you should have like facts and logic man uh, i mean this is just enacting whiteness then the other is co-host stephen a smith was a magnetic former newsman who hated jogging spent his nights in noisy arenas and sometimes rolled into the pre-dawn show with minister spare so this is so racist as claiming that, that the black guy the black guy doesn't do the homework doesn't do the hard work but the white guy is somehow meticulous and a better teammate, but the black guy is more colorful, has got, you know, the more magnetic personality. It's so concerning, these kind of racist tropes. The duo of Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith, the TV equivalent of uh, baking soda and vinegar, lasted fewer than four years, yet it changed the face of ESPN, the most powerful entity in sports media. It led to a host of imitators, inspired countless arguments about the role of TV and cable news itself. There was a big laudatory article about uh, Skip Bayless's Fox show, is it undefeated? In New York Times op-ed talked about, you know, what a great example of men talking to each other. So a ESPN ABC studied their morning show very carefully, and they found out that in virtually every instance, whenever a spike in a ratings occurred, there was one reason, Skip Bayless. All right, the white guy. All right, this is so racist. All right, they're, they're saying that the, the white guy, reason Skip Bayless, but was responsible for, for, for every spike in ratings. I mean, think about all the black labor that made this white guy, you know, his success possible. Do you think he could have done that alone if there weren't black people building bridges? There weren't black people building planes. There weren't black people building highways. There weren't black people who 200 years ago were forced to pick cotton and work as slaves like you think any of skip bayless's success would have been possible without the fair dinkum labor of black people and yet this bloody athletic article is just so racist man this is upsetting uh and that more racist stereotypes here skip bayless was the kind of guy who bought a camaro for the horsepower but said he only accelerated to the speed limit so here here's the white guy he's presented as being law-abiding He's presented as being pro-social. He, he's presented as taking into consideration the effect of his actions on, on other people. I, I mean, this is just white supremacism. I mean, what kind of person buys a Camaro for the horsepower but only accelerates to the, to the speed limit? Right? People who think they possess white bodies, that's who. Right? People who, who insist on enacting, enacting whiteness. Skip is a church mouse. That's his personality. So law-abiding, upstanding, moral bloke, right? The white guy. That's how he's presented. Man, so racist. There's not a single person that prepares more for their job than Skip Bayless, says the longtime First Take producer. Again, more racism, saying that the white guy is more dedicated, more meticulous, does more work, is more pro-social, you know, more, more of a team player. Uh, says that Skip Bayless formed arguments to force people, whether out of agreement or anger, to react. So this is Skip Bayless who thinks he inhabits a white body, getting out there, enacting whiteness, and, and forcing everyone else to respond to his arguments just because they're framed in such a compelling, coherent, you know, logically and emotionally demanding manner. So just because Skip Bayless is so good at his job, right? He he's going to get the he's going to get the credit here. Just because the ratings always spike when Skip Bayless is on? Man, you didn't know that sports journalists could be gurus? Wow, do I have a show for you, mate. The show needed to center on Skip Bayless. Yeah, the white guy. No one in the focus groups ever talked about Skip Bayless's debate partners on the show. Again, just totally devaluing the work of black people. When the numbers revealed around 50% of the first take audience was black. 
and they are tuning in to, to check out, right, Skip Bayless, the white guy who, who prepares, who does his homework, who obeys the law, who's like, tries to be a moral and upstanding citizen. Doesn't that just make you sick? So Skip Bayless has been a professional journalist for 40 years. He was profiled in the Washington Post back in 2013. He knows how to write profiles. One night, he thought about what makes Skip Bayless an interesting subject for a profile. He scribbled down nine bullet points. And here they are. Number one, the number one thing you should know about me, I've always tried to put God first in my life. I've often failed because I'm too proud and stubborn. When I was a little kid, going to a Methodist church, I envisioned one day I would become a minister, but I never pursued that. Now, if I have any regret, if I wasn't doing this job, I would be an orthopedic surgeon because I like to help people. I mean, look just showing the white guy working hard, wanting to help people, being a moral, upstanding citizen, not trying to come across as pious because I'm not. It's bigger than most people know about me. Yeah, that seems pretty fair dinkum true about Skip Bayless. And I'm presenting and decoding Skip Bayless because, precisely because he's not a guru, all right? Skip Bayless does not uh, pretend to have a galaxy brain. He speaks in a very plain, direct, easy-to-understand manner about topics that he knows something about, or at least he, he understands the emotional quality of the topics that he knows something about. I mean, Mark Cuban took him down uh, trying to show that uh, Skip Bayless didn't, didn't know what, what his own uh, defense was. So let's see if we, we can find that. Mark Cuban destroys Skip Bayless. Oh, Man. what's your, I, I, you may have more than one issue, but what's your biggest issue with Skip? It's not just Skip, it's, it's sports writers, sports media in general, where everything's generalities, right? Excruciating pressure. What the hell is that, right? You know, it was need leader. Excruciating pressure. That's it, what it was. Is that meaning what, Skip? Meaning that you personally watched up close and personal what LeBron went through last year against your Dallas Mavericks. Was it not the biggest collapse of a superstar? Okay, this is from, uh, 2011, June 22nd, 2012. That we've ever witnessed on a, a finals or championship stage? No, I mean, first of all, it's a team game. Right, you guys like to talk in complete generalities where no one can question you, right? You, you don't ever use facts, you don't ever use substance, you don't, don't ever, ever use, use facts. No. That's all I use on this show. What, excruciating pressure, undeniable this, you know, it's just all generalities. There, there's never been a star under more pressure going into a finals, a championship series or game than LeBron James was under after nine years and three league MVPs. Well, first of all, you have the presumption that people care what you say. They don't. That when well, the guys fine. go out there, when guys that's go your out opinion. there, no, no, I, I'm talking about media in general. When guys get ready to play and they're in the locker room, they're not thinking, okay, well, what's written, what's going to be written, what's being said, right? I mean, they're getting prepared. And if you've got a good coach and you've got a good culture, then guys are ready to play no matter what. Like you guys were just talking about, you know, Miami wanted to, wanted it more or less. Like that is just such, such horse, you know what, right? There's no such thing as team. It's not that Oklahoma City don't want it more. I think Miami was better prepared to play the game than. Oklahoma City in terms of, of adjustments and changes. Now, if you want to talk, talk about double teams and how they were used, whether or not they should have played zone, um, what defensive structure was in place, that's a valid conversation. But just saying they wanted it more, that's ridiculous. Okay. When you get to, when you're Kevin Durant and you're um, um, Derek Fisher and you're Russell Westbrook, etc., and you're at that, that closeout game, there's nobody that wants it more. It's just a question of who executes better, and then you decide why. Who once played you harder in the last games? In Miami. I think, uh, well, I'm a huge Skip Bayless fan, but I think uh, Mark Cuban is making great points. Making great points there. So I was up at 3 a.m. reading a book, Beer, Babes, and Balls, Masculinity and Sports Talk Radio. This book came out in 2007. It's by a practicing psychotherapist, a feminist, someone very much pro-gay says, I view masculinity as a social construction that assumes different forms in different historical moments and contexts. Yeah, I think that's true, but it also has an enormous genetic component, right? Men are genetically more aggressive and assertive than women. Uh, men are more naturally inclined towards hierarchy, towards developing legal systems. Okay, more from the book. Men can pay a cost in the form of poor health, shallow and narrow relationships for conformity with the narrow definitions of masculinity that promise to bring them status and privilege. Yeah, they can also pay an enormous price for way too broad definitions of masculinity, like way too many possibilities, right? I, I talked in an earlier stream this morning about healthy masculinity. So 
it should mean a substantial period of your time, of your spare time, should be spent just with blokes or with your, your family, right? Because men are genetically wired to try to have sex with as many women as possible. We need a civilization that disciplines male sexuality and male violence, so discouraging gratuitous violence and discouraging gratuitous sex, so give men a, a family to saddle them down with obligations, put the the male sexual genie in the marital heterosexual marital bottle, as Dennis Prager puts it, and give you know give men men only spaces, right? That's going to be healthier for them, so that they don't just wantonly spill their seed everywhere. A Martian arriving on planet Earth, not knowing what masculinity was, would quickly form the opinion that it is highly damaging and damaged, with very few if redeeming features. Yeah, uh, I severely doubt that, right? Everything constructed in our society, every, every building, every transportation system, almost all major systems of thought, almost all cutting-edge developments in technology were accomplished by men. So, yeah, we've had a social element in constructing masculinity. That, that's true. You had the late 19th century American male image was a rugged individualist who, to escape civilizing constraints, went to work in exclusively male preserves, went to war with other men, went west to find a fortune, pitted his will against the perils of nature. Yeah, that's uh, what one expression of masculinity is the U.S. became increasingly urban and mobile. Those masculine options were no longer available. Men were forced to look elsewhere to reclaim their lost identities. And one of the ways that they reclaim their lost identities now is by tuning into sports talk radio. It's virtually an all blokes medium, right? So when you're under assault by feminism, by the left, by the decrease in freedom of association, the substantial reduction in private property, in ever encroaching government civil rights industrial complex, litigating and investigating more and more of life, you're looking for a safe space, right? So where can blokes go to just be with blokes, right? What are some spaces where you can actively exclude women, you know, exclude people who aren't like you, right? So let's be honest, the major sports are overwhelmingly conducted by heterosexuals and are funded and attracted, attractive to heterosexuals. So sports talk radio is not usually a super gay place. Now, this book says, mediated sports texts reproduce the idea that traditional masculinity and heterosexuality are natural and universal rather than socially constructed. Well, I would say that the genetic component here is larger. I just don't think that, on average, gay men are as excited about sports and participate in sports as intensely, particularly violent sports, as heterosexual men, and I don't think that is 100% socially constructed. Sports talk is one of the only remaining spaces where men of all social classes and all ethnic groups can directly discuss such values as discipline, skill, courage, competition, loyalty, fairness, teamwork, hierarchy, and achievement. So sports and sports fandom and sports talk radio are sites of male bonding, one of the few such places left in our society. Right? And uh, sports talk is a form of civic discourse that teaches us how to create healthy community for people who frequently lead isolated, lonely lives. There's a major sporting event. The most socially inept person can get out there and socialize, go to a bar, and form a common cause and form bonds with other people. So in 2001, an addict of uh, sports talk, Alan Eisenstock, wrote a book called Sports Talk, a masculinist celebration of the significance of sports radio. He referred to sports talk shows as a nonstop fraternity party, a sports bar on the radio in which men and interact with other men free from the censure of feminism and political correctness. So sports talk radio is basically a dominantly heterosexual, male-only space reminiscent of the rise of fraternities and the Boy Scouts around the turn of the 20th century. Talk radio taps into a sense of public life. Right? It's some way of connecting our individual life with a wider community. It reduces anxiety by encouraging forms of identification. Right? It helps us overcome the isolation and exhaustion that comes from overworking. It fills in the increasing gap people feel between themselves, politicians, and our leading institutions. It's a novel, brash, and aggressive way of creating a group identity in neoliberal America. In talk radio and the American dream, we get 700 hours of talk radio. We find callers deeply worried about emasculation. So the natural order of things has been reversed with the civil rights industrial complex. 
so that crime, blacks, rich corporations, and women all seem to have the upper hand. Talk radio becomes a battleground in which to reclaim hegemonic masculinity and rid the cis space of soft-spoken New Age guys. Now, even though the callers lack the power to ward off the verbal put-downs of the host, they keep coming back for more. Sports talk radio, even more than political talk radio, is about the only arena left for white men who have been wounded by the assaults of all our major institutions, wounded by the indignities of feminism, affirmative action, the civil rights industrial complex, and all these other minority groups, you know, increasing rights, which comes at the stability and cohesion and social trust of the majority. So sports talk shows are a venue for the embattled white male seeking a recreation, seeking an identity, seeking a community. So one Atlanta sports station says, the fan, we make no pretensions what we're doing here. This is a guy's radio station. We are aiming at the men's bracket, which is the hardest to reach. The author says, uh, people in sports talk radio are wary of academics. They believe that scholars read too much into the messages in the media. They think that what they do is normal and ordinary. They take for granted what they do and say at work. And uh, the author of this book says he was driving on the freeway. He noticed a billboard that said, Armstrong and Getty, listen to them before we fire them. That is a great billboard. Right? So Armstrong and Getty are, continue to be syndicated local Sacramento talk show hosts of a popular following. They frequently mention on their show their fear of being fired, of saying something offensive or defying their station manager. And so this billboard is reflective of the volatility of the radio industry. So everyone gets fired in radio. I remember some joke I heard when I, I worked in radio about uh, a man confesses, look, my, you know, my mother's a kleptomaniac, my, my dad's a murderer, my younger brother's a, a homosexual, uh, all my cousins are in prison. Uh, how do I tell my girlfriend that I work in radio? Yeah, tremendous job at turnover in radio. Incredibly intense, right? Here's a good quote. We're all just renting our time in radio. Our jobs are never safe. Ratings are a constant source of tension. You can never stop thinking about it. And uh, the business of talk radio is to sell you stuff, all right? So you can call advertising a necessary evil, but in the final analysis, when you look at sports talk radio as a business, it's all about selling goods and services. So the advertisers are our number one priority, says one station manager. Without them, we can't give our listeners the sports stuff they want, but it is hard to always be pushing new products like the latest gadget or male enhancement pills. I got into this business because I love sports and call in programming not to push products. And many sports talk stations are just publicity machines for particular teams. So in Sacramento, KHTK, the sports talk station, has a contract with the NBA Sacramento Kings to wear their game. The KHTK sports talk hosts are employed by the Sacramento Kings to do play-by-play, pregame and postgame commentary. So the KHTK hosts essentially operate as cogs in an expansive promotional and media machine that mixes Kings announcers, players, media outlets, and advertisers all to capitalize and profit from the success of the only big name sports team in town. You're not supposed to badmouth the people in the sports franchise who pay you. You have to kiss ass to the advertisers, the kings, the corporate sponsors all the time. There's very little journalistic freedom. All right, let's get back here. Mark Cuban ripping Skip Bayless. He did every game. LeBron played harder than Kevin Durant did four straight games. That is the most ridiculous thing any sports writer has ever said. Now, if you oh. think when Kevin Durant walked off the court, he thought, yeah, I didn't play quite hard enough, mm -hmm. right? Now, you can say like he wasn't put it, that he wasn't put in a position to succeed. You could say that they didn't write the, run the right plays. They didn't get the ball to him on the block enough. And if you were smart, you'd come out and you'd have substance. you say, you know what? This is how many plays they ran to him on the block. Here's how Miami defended it. Now, you can also argue that the Pat, Pat Riley way is always the same way all the time. Miami played it the same way all the time. And then we can have a discussion, a discussion about adjustments. Like last year, did we play harder than the Heat? Is that what you think it was? No, I don't. I, I think LeBron disappeared and shrank in crunch time of the fourth quarter. And I can just show you the numbers of what he didn't do in every so fourth we, quarter. So we get no credit for not putting him in a position to succeed. Right. We played the Heat. Uh, he put himself in. All he did was stand out on the perimeter. Now, how do you think we defended that? Why do you think he was standing out there? I, I, you didn't have to defend it. Oh, right. So no matter what we did, he was just going to stand there and do nothing. Well, I... And is 40 saying that sports talk radio is healthier than political talk radio? No, but it is more masculine. I, 
I frankly don't listen to much sports talk radio, almost nothing. I don't know how sports journalists can be gurus. I, I guess my point is to contrast him with gurus because for all his flaws and lack of understanding and lack of command of facts, right, he is not claiming a galaxy brain. He's not claiming revolutionary theories. He's not some out-of-control narcissist. He's not uh, pushing victimization and, you know, woe is me and my true uh, social prestige has been denied me. He kind of conducts himself the opposite of of a guru. Whoops. Let me play more here from Mark Cuban. And that's all I saw. That was that was a lot that's of exactly it. Right, and, and that's that exactly right, Chip. And hope that all you saw saved the day for that's, him. You're exactly right. That's all you saw. You didn't look, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, th- and, and that's a complete insult to us mm-hmm. to say, you know what? The adjustments that we made. What did you do to force him out there? We we had different. T- we had like five, six, seven different types of matchups in our zone, mm-hmm. right? And we played here. man-to-man, and we had a variety of different switches, right? So we knew that, that 90% of his shots were going to come from the left-hand side, right? We knew that if you gave him room from the left, he was going to drive. Now, we didn't have the athletes in Oklahoma City, so we had to plan differently. Sure. So we need to make sure that we pushed him out away, and then we gave him different looks every time he had the ball, because just making him force, just forcing him to make a decision right to think about what he had to do taking the time to read are we in a zone what type of zone we in how are we matching up what type of rotations are we in making him think made them pass the ball around the perimeter which gave us a chance to adjust right now they're smarter they're a better team this year they deserve to win this year but you know that's the way we played it and so it wasn't just lebron lebron actually played it right more often than not he made the right pass to the right guy who didn't make the right play and that's exactly what we wanted we wanted to get the ball out of their hands and into the hands of somebody else who we wanted him to play Michael Jordan and make somebody play Steve Kerr. Now, last night, Mike Miller. They had was, several Steve yeah, Kerr. Okay, back uh, to this academic book on Sports Talk Radio. It talks about the tension between journalistic independence and the necessity to maximize advertising revenues. Most of the products advertised on sports radio, automobile, automobiles, beer, gadgets, mail enhancement pills, reflective of the laddish masculinity. Sports station ads such as Sports Talk Radio, it's just beer, babes, and brats. Gives the impression the staff are not really working. It's just one big frat party. Yet everyone I interviewed talked about long hours, fatigue, and work stress. So how do we get these discourses of hedonism in the face of increased corporate pressures and work strain? Perhaps the emphasis on pleasure-seeking is assembled to mask increasingly bureaucratic and rational features of the modern workplace. Stories of Sports Radio is one big laddish celebration obscure the fact the sports radio staff are all involved in rational bureaucratic work organizations, feature of many men's work experience in today's hyper-capitalist culture, and this type of bureaucracy are almost always feature HR departments run by left-wing women, and normal male behavior is an anathema in the modern bureaucratized corporate culture. Back to Mark Cuban. They had, they had everybody stepping up, but yeah. they deserved every bit. You know, so, but okay, you're, not, you're me, talking generalities. And, and just no, to I'm say, yeah, you are. Okay, you spewed out some generality about the players you. don't care. Okay, let me tell you that I, for a fact, and Stephen A can validate this, LeBron James listened to what I said for about, what, eight years? Because that's all I heard. He said I was his Howard Cosell. And this year, for the first time, to his credit, He tuned out all the noise. That's all we saw in the finals was he's reading the Hunger Hunger Games trilogy before the games. He's meditating on the bench before the games. He tuned us out. This is a Skip Bayless special. LeBron lost last year because he wasn't paying attention to Skip Bayless. LeBron no, won this year true. because he wasn't. That's no. what you just said. Okay. Did he well, not what, just say that? Okay. Here, here's what he didn't do. <laughs> here's what he didn't do against you guys. Okay. He let you off the hook because he didn't do what we saw him do for four straight games. He didn't drive through your zone and slash it up and dish. He he didn't post. Okay. Some uh, pretty good uh, stuff there from Mark Cuban. All right. Looking at this Northwestern website. Skip Bayless, how is sports media's most hated man so popular? And it says, five steps to a Skip Bayless hot take. One, moderator asks provocative question. Audience knows we'll get Skip riled up. So when I interviewed Lowell Cohn, who's got a PhD in English, very, very smart man, said Skip Bayless is better than anyone he knows, putting, putting his finger on the pulse of what's going on with sports fans. So example is LeBron James, the best player of this generation. Debate opponent makes a rational point. Skip then reframes the question. LeBron may be the best player born on the last Sunday of the week in December, but is he better than Michael Jordan? 
And Skip unleashes completely anecdotal argument that is impossible to prove is false. Then he gets thousands of retweets and comments calling him an idiot, rinses and repeats. Tomorrow on Undisputed, I'll explain to Shannon why Tim Tebow is the answer to the Patriots' QB problems. So what makes him so popular? Lots of columnists have hot takes. Lots of athletes have hot takes. Skip is eloquent. He's a strong TV personality. That is not enough. So to find out the answer, this author went on a 12-hour Skipathon content binge. So hour one, starting from his archives at the LA Times, it seems he's always had the clickbait gene. The first article had the title, Is Rose Cheating on Him or Jill? Which is in reference to safeties getting a step on QBs without them noting. He describes a racehorse as a dark chocolate beauty. In ESPN Sports Nation chat from 2009, he explains the origin of his LeBron James hate. Dear LeBron, never have I seen a player with zero rings heap more pressure on himself by acting more brazenly cocky about how he's going to win this championship. You dance during blowouts, you flex, you snap pictures before games. It's as if you're going to have the ring ceremony before Sunday's Game 1 versus the Pistons. You have now hit one walk-off jumper in six NBA seasons. Jordan did that every week, so now it's time to start showing us what you've got. No more excuses. Back it up and you will be king. And then there is a 2006 video that begins to explain how Skip Bayless became so popular. I've been reading him since about 1980, 81, 82. Okay, this is uh, Alan Iverson. Alan Iverson will turn out to be nothing but fool's gold in the Rocky Mountains. You know this and I know this because all he wants to do is chuck it up. He's on his best behavior now. 13 assists, very impressive. George Carlson, mad scientist heaven because he gets to show his coaching peers. He can so for me, listening to, to Skip is like the good part of, of getting you know, into porn, right? It's just so exciting. It's not the, the icky after, but when you're initially tuning into porn and the colors seem more vivid and your blood's flowing and you feel stronger and you, you know, you're getting revenge on all the women who have humiliated you and you're having like a soaring time after... You know, the drudgery of your day is that's kind of what it's like to to get a little skip bayless you can win with two of these little guys in the backcourt in boykins but in the end in, on january 22nd when the other superstar comes back all those assists will start turning into shots and this okay so alan iverson can't get over some comments that skip bayless has made fast forward a few years Skip repeatedly calls Chris Bosch Bosch Spice for playing soft with the Miami Heat. Chris Bosch is so annoyed he comes under first, first take. Like an adult, explain he takes pride in his family name and resorting to name calling isn't real analysis. It's a cheap shot. Skip looks him in the eyes, takes a deep breath, goes on a tirade about how he's a soft player and he won't stop unless Bosch plays tougher. Bosch admits that Skip motivates him. So that's our first hint. Right? Skip is popular because he gets infused with pro athletes and they go on the show like uh, Richard Sherman did to confront him for his ridiculous claims. Doesn't stop with athletes. Mavericks owner Mark Cuban wearing a Smurfs shirt when I first taken an annihilated Skip, not knowing the basics of how his own defense work. So Skip is not a sports expert. Mark Cuban exposes that. His arguments are anecdotal and opinions based with cherry-picked state stats. But wait, learn about double elevator screens, Horn's offensive set, and the intricacies of various offenses and defenses when you can argue about Jordan versus LeBron. So Skip fits into a particular landscape. Right? YouTube commentator David Ferguson says, A lot of people can't stand Skip. I love the guy. He is the face and the voice for the not-so-public opinion. What a lot of people don't understand is that his job isn't to be likable. His job is to entertain. So the money in entertainment and talk radio's entertainment is in being interesting not in being right so skip owns debate he, he balls deep in a nice bath where a man half his age made us all laugh to take focus off the fact that the old man straight out took his man card and slapped him with it okay skip bayless worked his way up from the average newspaper reporter to be one of the three faces of sports he still has that three hours of sleep run two miles at 2 a.m work ethic guys much younger than him couldn't possibly compete with Skip's one of those guys that is so hated when his time on earth is up, people will appreciate him in his absence. Without him, Shannon and Stephen A. and these sports shows would be as entertaining as the Today Show. So the line between love and hate is extremely thin. 
and uh, Skip Bayless has uh, tremendous entertainment value. His Twitter bio says, maybe not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Okay, so let's get some context comparing him with uh, Secular Gurus. This is from the academic podcast, Decoding the Gurus. That appeals to the conspiratorial mindset too. Um, there's literature on this um, where you know, it, it's a way for them to feel special and to feel better about their own lives. Yeah, and so you mentioned the tendency to encourage cultish dynamics. And um, this is not just a pejorative. We, when we are referencing this, we're talking about the fact that the gurus often establish these very strong binary in-group and out-group um, categories, right? And usually it's their followers and supporters are the good, moral, uh, wise people, and their out-group are malicious, bad faith critics who just want to tear everyone down. Um, so this this serves as, uh, along with a host of other um, behavioral patterns, to emotionally manipulate followers in order to... So I don't think you know, Skip is, is trying to establish parasocial relationship with his followers, but he is, I guess, mostly manipulating people with just very honed performances that are just high octane and kind of exciting and, and compelling to view. And I saw Skip on Beverly Drive on Monday, and I'm kicking myself that I didn't go up to him and tell him about the time I ran into Tom Landry when I was covering the 49ers and the Cowboys. And when I walked up to Tom Landry, the first time I seen him in person, Tom Landry was talking about how he hadn't talked to Skip Bayless in several years. And this and that about Skip Bayless. So 1985, December 22nd, 1985, first time I meet Tom Landry, he's talking about Skip Bayless. And uh, Skip, Skip says God's his number one priority in life. So what does that actually mean? Like, what does Skip sacrifice for God? Like, what does he not do because God's his number one priority? Right? How does making God his number one priority, how does that manifest in his life? I'd be curious. You get them to... Uh, protect the guru or uh, sometimes to launch attacks at people that might be criticizing the guru. But in, in many respects, it's things like uh, parasocial relationships are kind of unavoidable when consuming someone's content or, you know, with the internet the way it is. But there are people that cultivate and make use of those relationships to a greater and lesser extent. And gurus really strongly cultivate them by using like excessive flattery, often, often referencing like how, how, how their followers are like close friends to them and this kind of thing. And, and then similarly presenting themselves as wounded and vulnerable and in need of protection. It's kind of an interest. And uh, Skip Bayless doesn't do that. Interesting paradox because you have them as the all conquering polymathic genius, but they're also, you know, uh, in need of protection and constantly under attack. And the, the guru figure who does this most often recently, um, Jordan Peterson used to be the master of it, but I, I would point out Lex Friedman. Um, as somebody who's engaged in it, and I, I just have a reference. It's not the one that he did today, but he said uh, that he posted this on his Reddit. I'll have several different difficult conversations this year and next. I'll get attacked from all sides. I now understand that this is the way for anyone who seeks to empathize and understand in a divided world. I hope you. So anyone who works as, as hard as Skip Bayless does, anyone almost who is so driven to command an audience, right? There, people like me, people like Skip, who's obviously far more successful than me. We're obviously coming from a broken place. Skip Bayless says, both my parents were alcoholics. I come from a broken home. My mother forced me to take speech lessons from age 8 to 12 and uh, turned out to be great for him. And he talks about his job. It's not a job. It's my life. It's his highest priority, right? I still leap out of bed every day to do my job. I wear on people because of my, my strength. My weakness is my intensity. I bring it every day. I bring every last ounce that I have. Alcohol was rampant through my whole extended family. Then uh, Skip was influenced by his high school journalism teacher, Elizabeth Burdett. She made Skip feel like Hemingway. So he's had a passion for books, movies, theater, and several cable TV series rival his passion for sports. Nothing gives him more satisfaction than writing something that he likes. He loves fast cars, but he doesn't drive them above the speed limit. You know my heart and will still support me. I'll need it. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah it's funny It's funny you cited him because I was about to mention Lex because he was on my mind too. I mean, people often cite Lex as that he's just all about love and he's just trying to increase the amount of love and understanding in the world. But he also like ruthlessly <laughs> cuts off <laughs> communication with anyone who is not expressing 100% love back at him. Unless, my, unless they're famous. Ah, of course, yeah. So, he, you know, destiny or those kind of people, he'll tolerate a level of disagreement. But 
uh, if they're not a figure with a high enough profile, no. if gone. They're, if they're a normal person on Reddit, they, they're gone. Um, so yeah, I mean, people cite Lex's kind of kumbaya, love, love is the answer thing as an example of how he's really a good guy and not all that bad. But to be honest, I've always seen these elements of cultishness in it. It's um, and it's it's particularly in Lex's case, it's particularly clumsy. It's not even it's not even particularly. It's at the surface, but it's yeah. a, it's it's very effective. Like you know, the, for the amount of people that kind of criticize Lex and kind of see through it, just look at the comments that he hasn't blocked. It's loads of people saying, we love you, Lex. We know that you're what's in your heart. We need people like you in the world and so on. And like the, the thing which he tweeted out today said, I will speak with everyone and I will get attacked, derided and slandered for it. But I believe in the power of long form empathetic conversation to help discover our common humanity, including the good and the evil we are all capable of. I know I'm underqualified and underscaled for these conversations, so I'll often fall short as I do in all aspects of my life, but I'll work hard to improve and will never ever give in to cynicism. Right. And it, it's, a, it's a beautiful encapsulation, but this is in reference to Lex conducting fawning interviews with no pushback with Benjamin Netanyahu most recently. Um, and, and a host of controversial figures where he, he gives very mild pushback, or I think his strongest is probably with Kanye West, who was spouting overt anti Semitism. But even in that conversation, the main thing that Lex focused on was when Kanye said he didn't trust Lex. That's the thing which he found most hurtful and, and returned to at the end of the conversation. So it's just, but it's that wounded bird pose of, I'm doing good. And I'm going to be attacked like Jesus. It almost sounds like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's no mention of accurate criticism, right? It, it, the bit at the end, you might say that, well, he's admitting he's at fault, but notice that he, he didn't at the beginning say, you know, I'll be legitimately critiqued for making mistakes or being too soft. No, he said, I'll be attacked, derided and slandered. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, that's good. That's um, called these dynamics, encouraging them. Okay. Well, we haven't done, we haven't done pseudo profound bullshit. One of my favorite, uh, Domains of the grammar, Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have my notes here. What have you got? <laughs> well, I'll, so this this is usually paired with a tendency to um, make use of neologisms. Not always. Okay, neologism, like uh, coining, coining, you know, fancy acronyms. So, what's a guru from the perspective of decoding the gurus? All right, someone who produces something that sounds profound, but isn't. All right, uh, Skip Bayless is not pushing, you know, pseudo profundity. Right, just very plain spoken, fair dinkum bloke. Uh, galaxy brainness, people who present ideas that are just too profound for the average mind to comprehend. Right, that's not Skip Bayless. He's not you know, claiming galaxy brainness. Cultishness, right, where people who like me are good people and people who don't like me are bad people. Skip Bayless doesn't do that. He's not building a cult. He has no interest in building a cult. Anti establishment, so the orthodoxy, the establishment, the mainstream media, the expert consensus are always wrong. Uh, maybe a tiny little bit of, or a mild, mild amount of this. So maybe a two out of five in this area for, for Skip. Grievance mongering, uh, pretty mild. Uh, feeling excluded and disregarded and disrespected. Narratives of grievance, very mild with, with Skip Bayless. Self-aggrandizement and narcissism. It's impossible to do a job like uh, Skip Bayless does without having a sense of grandiosity and an inflated idea of one's self-importance, but he seems to be quite functional. Uh, Cassandra Complex, the gurus love to talk about how the end of the world is at hand. Skip does not do this. Revolutionary theories, he doesn't claim to have revolutionary theories. Pseudo-profound BS, right? I don't think Skip does this either. But, you know, inventing your own terminology uh, is something that gurus like to do. And um, pseudo-profound bullshit is, uh, it sounds pejorative, which it is, but it, it is also a term from the psychology literature, and it refers to... Uh... Yes, this is Chris Cavanaugh. He's a professor at Oxford University. He lives in Japan. He is Irish, and his co-host in the Decoding the Gurus podcast is Matthew Brown. He's at the University of Central Queensland. He's a fair dinkum Australian psychologist. So Christopher Cavanaugh is an anthropologist. Matt Brown, his co-host, is a psychologist. So Chris has his gain turned out much higher than Matt Brown. Uh, language that appears profound, but it, it, once you kind of like look, consider it or, uh, critically, it's saying something very mundane or uh, something which looks deep, but is actually quite shallow. And um, I, I think that uh, an aspect of it can be 
where you're referencing technical terminology that sounds very complicated. You're making reference to these abstract or obscure theories, often referencing the, the particular names which most people would know of the relevant theorists as well. But you're not doing so actually to kind of explain the theory and elucidate some point that you really need to reference the theory. No, the, the reason for signaling it or for referencing it is to reflect back on how much you know and how great your technical expertise is. That it's, it's almost hard for you to sink down to a normal level to communicate with people because you're just bustling with so many high level concepts, right? Um, did I miss anything with that, Matt? What else would you put in the pseudo profound bucket? And you better unmute yourself. <laughs> It'll just be silence. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's right. Look, it's different from the other domains we talked about because pseudo profound bullshit is really about the sort of the language, like the, the, the sort of syntactic structure. Um, as you said, the buzzwords, the jargon that people are using and, you know, stringing together words and sentences that give the appearance of saying something profound and meaningful, but actually are not really saying anything much at all. An example could- And Skip Bayless does not do this at all. Be as beings of light, we are local and non-local, time-bound and timeless actuality and possibility. I mean, you know, that sounds kind of okay um, if you um, don't analyze it carefully, but if you think about it, it doesn't really mean anything. Deepak Chopra is the ultimate coiner of pseudo-profound bullshit. Um, he said things like imagination is inside exponential space-time events. Noticing he's referencing some sort of physics type stuff there, but he's connecting it to imagination. It makes no sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, what, what else to say about pseudo I'd, Well, I'd, I'd highlight that like, although the term originally is kind of associated with Deepak Chopra and the the kind of quantum woo proponents. And you do find that amongst the secular gurus um, on occasion. Uh, I think their variety is a little bit different because it will often be referencing like evolutionary theorists or psychologists, or uh, it can also be seen in just the way that they respond to certain ideas. Like I, I have a transcript in front of me where it says, um, Jordan Peterson was talking to Brett Weinstein about the possibility that hospitals are net negative. Like they, they harm more people than they can heal because of things like superbugs and you know uh, medical mistreatments and, and so on. And uh, Jordan says, no, that's just a guess. And it could easily be wrong, but it, but it also could not be wrong. And Brett Weinstein takes a pause then and says, the fact that it's even plausible is a stunning fact. And, and then they ramble on night. That to me is kind of taking the language of recognizing profundity. But what you've just <laughs> issued for is uninformed bullshit. But if somebody reacts as if it's a deep profundity, it, it creates the impression that something important was being transmitted. And the sense makers are often extremely guilty of this. Yeah, the sense makers. Yeah, just go listen to the sense making episode. Um, you'll you'll hear so many examples of it. I, I for a bit of fun once, Chris, I um I asked GPT four to to look at a few of Eric Weinstein's tweets and tell me whether or not they were super profound bullshit or not. And well, he could say whether it was right or wrong, but he had the same <laughs> assessment that I did on every one of them. What one of the tweets I gave it was this one. Eric Weinstein tweeted, when you first realized that in the summer of 69, Brian Adams was not yet 10 years old, you were supposed to extrapolate that the world pretty routinely speaks in coded messages. Wow. <laughs> like, you know, just, just, just mull over that for a little while and see whether or not yeah. uh, you think that's bullshit. I, I'd, I'd also add to it, Matt, that um, part of the reason that the gurus are so competent in this area is that they tend to have very high levels of verbal fluency. They're able to speak in an autodidactic kind of way, just stream of consciousness, often without the usual verbal tics that inhabit normal mortal speech. Um, and the, that content is liberally peppered with, you know, obscure references, technical jargon, and, and so on. But it, it's their, their fluency and their, often their use of metaphor or metaphorical language that, that, that also marks them out. And we... So early this morning, I read another book called Yappy Days Behind the Scenes with Newsers, Schmoozers, Boozers, and Losers. Right, it's a book by talk radio producer Bernadette Duncan. She's married to the wife of Talkers Magazine publisher and editor Michael Harrison. And she discusses what makes some people, you know, on air big time celebrities. And it's being indispensable right? for, for advertisers, for an audience, right? The, the sense that, that the performer is indispensable, that people have to listen to him, have to get his hot take. And, uh, 9-11 was an interesting day because uh, Howard Stern was, was on the air when the Twin Towers were hit, and his producer said something listeners would never hear on news stations anywhere else on radio shortly after the attack. He said, it's a terrorist attack, isn't it? So the Howard Stern crew connected the dots, moved the story forward basically 100% correctly. Now, the news reporters up and down the dial were straightjacketed, mostly repeating and repeating only that which they knew could be verified. And one of Howard Stern's cohorts asked him, why doesn't the news just call it like it is? And Gary, the producer, piped up, well, they're a legitimate news organization. They're not allowed to say what we are thinking. So that's a big difference between talk radio and the news. 
Now, people who are doing the news are not supposed to say what they're thinking. People in talk radio get to say what they're thinking, and sometimes what people are thinking is more true than the news. So talk radio is a place where people can discuss the messy and ugly parts of life, speaking from a less tailored part of the brain. So radio people are notorious for poor spelling, unkempt hair, and wardrobe. And callers know they can anonymously say the sorts of stuff normally shared with a friend over the bathroom stall. Uh, she also worked for Lou Dobbs, and he said that he insisted on a script writer, and she was struck silent. Lou Dobbs wanted someone who'd write out his monologues, his transitions, and even his interview segments. A script writer for a radio talk show? Spontaneity is the very essence of talk radio. Spontaneity is the heart of the beauty of talk radio. If you script a talk radio show, you lose the genre. It becomes something else. Since when is a talk show scripted? Radio, the naked human voice, is the great exposer. You can't act your way into these thrills and revelry. It builds from within. It goes deeper than words. It brings out the things that make us human. You can't read your way through the thil- thrill for winning home run. You must feel your way or there's a disconnect. The same principle applies in talk radio for the natural flow of conversation. We often see in the content that in lots of occasions, the gurus just replace uh, argument with a metaphor. They just say it's like, and they, they give a metaphor and, and they, they describe the metaphor in great depth, but they haven't actually demonstrated that the argument is, is valid. They've just kind of talked about things in a metaphorical plane, and then they move on yeah. to the next topic. And yeah, yeah that is, it's not exactly what the sort of profound bullshit concept captures, but it's, it's definitely in a related um, no, family. I think I know what you mean. And I think, our, I think it is helpful to have a bit of a broader, more inclusive sort of uh, approach with this sort of profound bullshit thing. Because like you said, it is, has got a lot to do with that facility with language. Um, they are well-educated people, very loquacious. And there are, like all of us use the form of language as kind of an indicator, you know, as a kind of a, uh, and it, you know, um, t- t- that it's not just functional. Yeah, that's right. We, it's it, it's uh, performative as well. And so, you know, if you do things like, you know, reference technical scientific terms, if you're using, if you're mentioning equations, if, if, yeah. you're, if you're using this kind of academic language, then all of that stuff is taking it as signifiers that that something meaningful is being said. Now, I'll give you another example of all of these things in another Eric Weinstein tweet quiz. This tweet said, one, disinformation plus um, the plus symbol, informed consent equals disinformed consent. Two, malinformation leading to non-consent leads to malinformed refusal to consent. Three, malinformation and disinformation were defined by deviation from a state narrative based on questionable objective slash science. <laughs> right, now that's, that's a word salad on one level, but he, he is using what seems superficially to be very precise language, right? He's, he's, he's using a form of expression which um, seems like it's like, like grounded in, in, in something. It's just if you try to pass out what's being said, it either means very little or he's just repeating standard conspiratorial oh, right. yeah, I was, in a fancy way. I was going to say that I can parse that. Like I can, I can follow that because I'm very familiar with the issues that the conspiracy theorists have with those terms. And, no, and so, I, can, I, can, I can pass it too, Chris, but I think my point there is that the, like, it's saying something that's straightforward. Quite, quite straightforward in a very complicated way, in, in, in a way that I guess encourages people to think, well, this is profound. This is saying something true. Yeah, yeah and uh, Skip, Skip Bayless doesn't play that game. Now, the part of the barometer number nine conspiracy mongering to gain real insights real special knowledge that nobody else can see that is very hard work for normal people even a lifetime of study and research only provides a few scant original intellectual contributions that's not nearly enough for a guru guru needs a steady supply of fresh original content to supply to their followers and to justify their status to be a guru they must set themselves up not only as uniquely insightful but above and apart from all orthodoxies including established political and ideological groups. Thus, they are encouraged to go beyond standard heterodoxy, contrarianism, and skepticism into the realm of conspiratorial ideation. So I think Skip is only relatively mild to moderate in doing this. This is because the expert consensus, though naturally not infallible, but by definition tends to supply the most reasonable and evidence-based view based on current information. So the guru is in the position of needing to provide a strongly contrasting perspective to the expert consensus. And the only way to supply that is to have something that backs up your bold claims in a compelling way. This leads inexorably down the path of conspiracy mongering, right? Where you come to alternative views of events that authoritative sources cannot or won't tell you about. And conspiracy theories require a suppressive network to explain away the lack of evidence and support and why nobody is willing to accept the guru.